All right, everybody, I hope you can see this. We're trying to get uh, caught back up here after the hurricane days here. And we're after the Persian Wars in Greece, where when the Persian Empire is defeated by the underdog Greeks, this is an enormous turning point in world history. After the Greeks win this unbelievable victory, in the city-state of Athens, the world's first democracy, working democracy is created. It's not perfect, um, but it's the closest the world has seen to um, massive political representation that the world has ever seen. And so at the end, Athens and Sparta become the two leading city-states of ancient Greece. Now, Athens will be destroyed in the Persian Wars, but it will be re rebuilt again, bigger, faster, stronger, like the old Six Million Dollar Man TV show, with an even larger statue of Athena. And during this time, the Athenians are going to turn towards the statesman named Pericles, who was a general in the Persian Wars. And he's going to rule as kind of like president of Athens for about 30 years, from 460 to 429 BC. And his leadership is going to bring in what is known as the Golden Age of Athens. Between the Persian Wars and the upcoming Peloponnesian Wars is this 30 year period where everything in Athens is just wonderful and great. Art, architecture, sculpture, democracy, it is all created. And it is under his leadership that Athens becomes the first democracy. And what he creates is a thing known as a direct democracy. What this simply means is that all citizens, again, you've got to be male of, of you know, voting age is that you get to come to the assembly and you get to vote. And direct democracy works like this. Let's say I said, okay, we're going to get pizza tomorrow. How many people want plain cheese on their pizza? And you guys raise your hands. Okay, 11 of you voted for just cheese. How many of you want pepperoni? All right, that's 22 of you. All right. So 22 is more than 11, so it's majority wins. 22 outranks 11, so we're getting pepperoni on our pizza. But more importantly, you see how everybody voted. Who voted yes and who voted no. So if you ask them via the Socratic method, Gracie, why did you vote no? Luke, why did you vote let? yes? People should be able to back up their choice. And what Pericles says, that everybody should help take part in the day-to-day -day running of the government. This is how it is supposed to be. The outcome of the vote is immediate, and you know who voted and which way they voted. Who votes yes, and who votes no. And Pericles began to believe, and impart this on the um, citizens of ancient Athens, that a citizen bore a special responsibility to their city. To have a successful democracy, people have to care about it. They have to want to be involved. And that is what is so difficult about democracy. We're coming up to the midterm elections, and we may get a halfway decent turnout, but we may not. Because if it's not a big election, like president or governor, a lot of people don't care. And Pericles was like, no, you've got to want it. You've got to be active. You've got to research the candidates. You've got to find all of these different North Carolina amendments. Do you like them? Do you not like them? You've got to research, and you have got to make that choice. And so Pericles began to believe that if a person didn't do this, if they didn't take an active part in doing what they were supposed to do, they weren't harmful to the city. They were useless. All right? You are a threat to democracy. You are not harmless, but you are useless. 
And they had a thing known as ostracism, where if you are found out not taking part, not being, will, not being willing to serve, you could be kicked out of the city for up to 10 years. And so during this time, Pericles is going to be everywhere. He's going to use money to rebuild the city. He's going to recruit artisans and sculptors from all over the ancient world. So he's going to increase the Parthenon and make it bigger than it was before. He's going to rebuild the 40-foot golden statue that today sits at Vanderbilt University or the one that Annabeth and Percy dug out of the Roman Colosseum. There it is. Now it's on Camp Half-Blood or wherever it is. He's going to rebuild and expand the city-state of Athens, a newer, bigger Acropolis. He's going to enlarge a defensive wall. He's going to build a defensive wall all the way, all the way to the seaport called the Port of Piraeus. And Pericles is going to increase jobs and prosperity for Athenian artisans and workers in and around the city. And when he was done, Athens was absolutely beautiful. It looked great. Athens was outstanding. It was the cultural icon. Artisans, sculptors, educators, merchants from all over the world went to Athens. Problem is, Pericles was so good at doing everything, the people let Pericles do everything for them. Are we, do we have enough food? I don't know. Pericles will take care of it. Of the workers building the defensive walls? I don't know. Pericles is on it. Is the construction of the new high school or the Acropolis on schedule? We don't know. Pericles is on it. And the problem is, people were so reliant on Pericles, they just let him do everything. He was so good at it. Why get in his way? Just let him, just let him do it. And this brings up you know, something known as the Delian League. The Delian League is created in 478 BC, right after the Persian Wars. It was a defensive alliance where Athens said that Persia may come back and attack us again. To be part of the Delian League, um, to protect Greece from again another round of Persian attacks, member city states joined up, and they agreed that if any single one of them were attacked by Persia, the rest were obligated to jump in and help. The other members would come to their rescue. So a treasury was set up on the neutral island of Delos, where a way to be part of the Delian League is you did one of two things. You either paid money into the treasury, or you provided ships, weapons, and men to fight off the Persians. Now immediately after the war, Sparta was offered the job of being the leader of the new unified so-called Greeks. And Sparta said, no, nope, we fought as allies, Persia's gone, we're going back to Sparta to do our Spartan stuff. And so Athens becomes the leader, they become the head of the Delian League. But as time goes on, it seemed clear to people that Persia wasn't going to come back and attack again. And people of the Delian League began to resent Athens because they were taking money from the Delian League treasury to rebuild Athens. And member city-states said, why are you doing that? You shouldn't be able to do that. And Athens said, well, we were destroyed by Persia. And the other member city-states said, yeah, but well, you, you started it. And Athens said, look, all of you guys are paying money. We are providing all the men and all the equipment. You're just throwing in cash. So yeah, we're taking it. Matter of fact, we're going to move the treasury from Delos to Athens. And little by little... Some member city-states began to refuse to pay into the Delian League. And Athens says, uh-uh, this is like the Mafia. Once you're in, you're in for life. And if they didn't pay, Athens threatened them. Athens bullied them and said, if you don't pay, we'll come and conquer you. And others said, well, wait a minute. You're acting just like 
King Darius did to the colonists in Ionia. Don't say that. That is not true. We are not, we are not bad. And they're like, well, actually, you're worse. You're doing the exact same thing. So, this makes many of the city-states unhappy. When they refuse to pay, Athens subjugates them and takes them over. And so a lot of city-states begin to resent this. And Greece will be split into two camps. One that will favor Athens and be led by Athens. The other group will be led by Sparta. People were very worried about Athenian domination of the entire country of Greece. So Sparta will form a counter-alliance that you'll see in a second, known as the Peloponnesian League. And so Greece becomes the original um, former allies who are now enemies, just like the United States and the Soviet Union after World War II. The United States was head of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Remember countries, the United States, West Germany, England, France, you know, Australia, Canada, headed by the United States. The counter-alliance was known as the Warsaw Pact, headed by the Soviet Union. Subjugated countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, Romania, Hungary, who formed the Iron Curtain. The only difference is, in the NATO countries, you signed up willingly. In the Soviet Union, you didn't have a chance. But everybody had to pick a side. The United States on one side, and, and the Soviet Union on the other. Athens on one side, Sparta on the other. Now, I'm not saying one of these is good and one of these is Russian, Soviet communist, one of them is American, but you get the point. Everybody had to pick a side. And as a result, as Athens, Athens gets more and more and more powerful, other member city-states join the Peloponnesian League. The purple down here, like Corinth and Sparta and Thebes, are Peloponnesian League city-states, and the orange are Athenian ones. And so as Sparta's counter-alliance gets bigger, war is going to break out between Athens and Sparta in 431 BC. It had been a series of years between the end of the Persian Wars and the start of the Peloponnesian ones, and Athens wins a few victories at sea. So Sparta decides to take the war inland and lay like a good old medieval fastened siege to Athens. But Athens built with Pericles a defensive wall from the Acropolis all the way down to their main seaport at Piraeus. It was like a small miniature Great Wall of China. So no matter that the Spartans laid siege to it, they could still get cargo in and out during their seaport. Pericles, however, signaled that all citizens of Athens should come inside and be safe inside the city walls. And the war is going to last several years, and no one really thought about leadership because Pericles always did everything. This is when Socrates speaks up, and he begins to say, Guys, why aren't we asking questions about the leadership rules? The Spartans are outside knocking on the gates. And what had just happened was that a plague is going to break out. After years of being locked up, a plague breaks out and kills one-third of the city-state of Athens, including... Pericles. And after his death, the leadership of Athens is in turmoil. Nobody knows what to do. Well, how do we know if enough food is being grown? Well, we don't know. Pericles always did it. Well, do we have enough freshwater wells? I don't know. Pericles always did all of that. How do we get cargo in and out? I don't know. Pericles always did it. No one knew how to lead because Pericles had been so good Everyone let him do it. So when Socrates comes along and says, guys, quit fighting amongst yourselves. 
How are you going to solve the crisis? What are your ideas? They get mad at him and brand him a traitor. He says, I'm not mad at you, but the enemy, instead of fighting over who's going to be the next Pericles, the Spartans are knocking on the gosh darn door. Can we focus on that? And while the enemy was literally knocking on the gates, Sparta goes over and they ask for help. They go to someone who had a navy over in Persia. So the Spartans go over, say three or four of them, they knock on the door of Persia. The Persians say, who's there? The Spartans, oh God, the Spartans, everybody run! The Spartans are here, go, 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 go! And they're like, easy, easy, there's only three of us and it's okay, we didn't bring any weapons. Yeah, but still, there's three of them, what are we going to do? And the Spartans say, we're not here to attack you, we're here to ask you for your help. Our help? You want our help? Well, we're just Persians and you're Spartans. They're like, yeah, we got a problem with Athens. Matter of fact, we're up. we are at war with them. Would you like to help out? And the, and the Persians were like, yeah, what do you want us to do? And they said, well, if you could bring your navy and block the port of Piraeus, they'll starve. When it's done, you guys can loot the city, you can burn the city, you can take all the money out of the city, but you can't kill or enslave the Athenians. The Persians like, a chance to get back at, at Athens? Oh man, they beat us twice. This is going to be awesome. Persia wanted that chance, whoops, at revenge. When the Persian navy shows up, they blockade the port, and Athens was forced to surrender. And this loss causes Athens to lose their city as it is destroyed once again. The newer, bigger Parthenon destroyed again. The 40-foot-tall golden statue of Athena destroyed again. And the Persians want to enslave the Athenians, but the Spartans say, no, nope, they were allies against you. We said you could destroy the city, but you can't enslave them. And while this was a victory for Sparta, it cost the Greeks their empire. Um, Athens not only loses its power and its prestige, but Sparta on the way back home were attacked from another member city-state. I want to say that it's Thebes. And they had been at war with the Athenians for nearly 30 years, so they were weakened, and they were defeated, costing Greece their empire. But in that 30 years, some great cultural achievements will be created, and that's what we are going to talk about in tomorrow's lesson. I'll see you guys then. AP World, Peloponnesian War Bed Story, over and out.